if we are safe with the sensuality in our body and we allow it to move up into our chakras, I can sit here and have a tantric experience, you know, with a person just by sitting across from them. Sex does not have to be involved, but it can be an extremely healing gateway or sensuality. It doesn't even have to be sex. Mm -hmm. Sensuality is this amazing healing gateway to allowing ourselves to connect deeper. Um, with the other person allows us to to love in a deeper way allows us to be there for our children this is one a huge benefit i have found hello and welcome to curious ones podcast by andara I'm Yael Ginsberg, the host of the podcast, a yoga and meditation teacher and philosophy lover. Each week you will hear eye-opening interviews with the different teachers of the Yandara Yoga Institute located in beautiful Baja, Mexico, along with other teachers that pass through here. This life-changing knowledge shared through authentic, heartfelt communication will help you live a happier, more fulfilled and connected life. Let's dive in. I might just disappear with some of your yeah, things. Yeah, I probably won't even notice. <laughs> you, won't. Yeah. you will never notice. <laughs> I'll be like, send you for pictures from Israel, like, thanks, Anne. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm, when I'm done with this outfit, I'm going to send it to you. Okay. okay. We have that recorded. Yes, yes. <laughs> so. I promise. Yeah, when I'm done with this outfit, I will sell, not sell it. I will send it to you. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I think we can um, <coughs> segue from here. Mm -hmm. um, whoever's listening to this via audio, check out my outfit <laughs> on the video. It's from Anne's Closet and I'm keeping it. It's worth checking out. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's just go into it. Welcome to Curious Ones Podcast. I'm Yael Ginsberg and my lovely guest today is Anne Dinsmore who was on the podcast before. She is a an experienced yoga teacher here at Yandara. She's been here for eight years. Incredible teacher who teaches usually in the 200-hour teacher trainings. Um, in our previous podcast, we spoke about many different topics, but one of the topics that came up was um, sexuality and sensuality and human connection via sexuality. And we both really wanted to explore that and go deeper. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Um, let's just start with your personal experience of your own sexuality. Yeah, I guess when I was younger, I found sexuality to be very confusing, um, which I think most people do. Um, wasn't necessarily prepared for sexuality in general or you know that transition through puberty and so um, at a pretty young age I started to feel sensual in my body um, and um, found different ways like different outlets I guess or expressions um, which were also extremely confusing um, so when I was younger I with one of my neighbors <clears throat> Um, you just had like an in like felt very sensual but didn't really know what to make of it and it was like pretty jarring in my body um, and then with one of my girlfriends like at a sleepover kind of started to you know like little kids do you know you touch yourself or you know explore um, with your friend or something you know just kind of like these new feelings and um, that was also I mean it felt very good um, but at the same time, I felt shame around it. And I don't really know why um, at that time, you know, like the, with no um, perceivable and in that moment, um, no perceivable relationship with sensuality. So kind of like right away, like already feeling like there was something bad about it or to be hidden about it. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I was uh, having a sleepover and one of my girlfriends, she just touched my breasts Mm -hmm. and um, it felt so good but immediately when my parents I could hear them coming we stopped and they were like right away like knowing that it's something that we shouldn't be doing yeah um, so I always found that very interesting that at that 
very young age, kind of like my first sensual experience, um, I already had a relationship with it that uh, I felt like there was something wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I'm just going to interrupt you because I feel like I had a very similar experience. I did inner child work with a therapist and we kind of like went back and the thing that came up was that like a, one of the reasons that I don't feel comfortable with sexuality was because when I was like four years old or something like that, I had a neighbor and we kissed and like just the fact that I felt like I need to hide it made me kind of feel like I need to hide my whole sexuality. And it came up for me like what I was like 28 when I did that um, that experience. And it's so interesting how this little small experience that I would never give any weight to was m so memorable to me in terms of how it changed my whole the like my whole approach to my sexuality and the way that I act and perceive it. Totally. And from working with so many people um, with my work and talking to a lot of women primarily, mm -hmm. uh, but men are definitely not excluded from the same type of feelings and scenarios, um, <clears throat> is that I would say like, so from the eight years that I've been working with people, I would say 90% of people have experiences that are similar to this, mm -hmm. um, just very confused, like, without being prepared for like what that is what's happening when we start to change and start to receive this sensual energy um i would say 90 percent of people have unresolved issues that have really changed yeah. kind of how they connect with people and how they have their relationship with their sensuality but when does it start like what age i'm not too sure but um just like from what i've read and <clears throat> talking to people some people very young like eight years old whereas mm -hmm. some people don't start feeling sensual until they're in their teens so i think it just really varies depending on when you start to make the get the hormones yeah. in puberty but i feel like it's earlier than we think yes i mean i how old was i in those experiences i think one of them i was probably like nine years old or something um yeah that started to feel the maybe even eight mm -hmm. started to feel kind of these these other feelings mm -hmm. and like you were saying like you felt like oh it was like nothing you know like um, yeah. but it affected you so much and like a, an example of this could be like a young boy who um it could be a girl too but young boy who has his hands down his pants and he's mm -hmm. touching himself because it feels good yeah you know and he's like a child and then mother or father says like hey get your hands out of your pants that's bad hmm. and so like just even that little moment. like moment yeah can start to create that relationship with those sensual feelings that those sensual feelings are bad or yeah. when i feel like that I get yelled at. It's mm -hmm. bad. So yeah. we start to shut down and mute our sensuality um, mm -hmm. because we don't know what it is. We think there's something wrong with us. Um, and it's something that's bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So both of these early experiences were with um, females. And then actually, um, since I enjoyed the feelings, I initiated this with one of my other girlfriends and she shut me down super hard mm -hmm. and we actually stopped being friends after that mm -hmm. so I really started to be like you know yeah there's something bad about this mm -hmm. um um and I phoned I was talking on the phone with my nanny my mom's mom and um I said nanny what's a lesbian I had heard the term lesbian on Friends, the show, and I knew what it was. And since my experiences were with females, mm -hmm. I was like, hmm, maybe if I'm right about this word, that maybe I'm a lesbian. Mm -hmm. um, and so I asked her and then I got yelled at and said, Anne, don't say that. Mm -hmm. Like, so just so many like yeah. of these reinforcers that anything to do with sexuality was like taboo. Especially if it's not like male, female sexuality. Totally. Yeah. Yes. Um, so that kind of was how um, I was introduced to sexuality. And um, like I would say most uh, households in um, where I grew up, um, which was Canada, um, again, this is from talking and experience with talking to so many people is that so many people's families don't prepare them for sensuality and for puberty and sex because it can feel like an awkward topic. Mm -hmm. And also the 
oftentimes the parents um, who are responsible for the child, perhaps they don't even feel comfortable themselves, with themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you talk to your children about yeah. sensuality? When do you talk to them? What age do you talk to them? Um, so there's a lot of, it's a pretty tricky subject. Mm -hmm. um, so then after, um, so then fast forward a little bit to kind of starting to, um, go into my teens and getting boyfriends and stuff like this. Um, let's see. I would, I considered myself like a pretty sexual or sensual person. Um, it's like, um, yeah, I knew something was there in terms of like, could feel these feelings. And if, if I got close to somebody, then that was just a natural thing that came up or the activation of our second chakra, which has mm -hmm. to do with connecting with one another, yeah. a human connection. So as I would get close to somebody, I would get these feelings. And guess what those feelings were? They were bad mm. right? because of the relationship. So any time, it, like, it totally stopped me from being able to connect to people or connect in a deeper way because I feel these feelings, they're bad. So I would push them away or the opposite, I would act on them. Mm -hmm. And without the, at a pretty young age, like 14, 15, so um, without any education mm -hmm. or anything mm -hmm. about it, I would, yeah. you know, have sex or, you know, um, be sensual with somebody. And then uh, it would feel... It would it would just be awkward, you know, like awkward kids having sex, basically. Yeah. Um, and so again, it's kind of um, started to create that um, relationship with sensuality, like um, that it was. It, it, I guess it created like a box of what it is. You know, this mm -hmm. is what sensuality is. Um, it's the man, <clears throat> the male. In my experience would he'd get off. He'd have an orgasm and then it would be over mm -hmm. you know? and there wasn't much um, um yeah no dialogue yeah no reciprocity and so um and again not to the man's fault but if if no if both parties aren't educated on what sexuality is and they're you know still trying to figure out these feelings in their own body then that would just be you know i would say that even more than not being educated it's being educated in a certain way like what we knew about sexuality was what we saw in movies, I feel like that that's the only way that we learned about sensuality, sexuality, like what we see in movies, which is like a totally acted scene of something exaggerated and maybe idealized without like, you know, there's no conversation, there's no foreplay, it's just like this animal sex ripping up the clothes and the man is like, you know, doing everything. Totally. Um, so that kind of um, prepares the frame of mind for us in approaching it in an age before we are able to be educated on it. Yes, and I would say like most people's education, well, at least mine was um, from movies, you know, even like human connection or the male-female relationship, um, how it was um, portrayed to me would have been through like Disney movies. So mm -hmm. the innocent, you know, <laughs> helpless little female yeah. and the, you know, the have to be strong, no feelings male, mm -hmm. um, the woman submissing to the man, needing the man. Yeah, waiting um, for him to save her. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> And so imagine going into those scenarios, like having this, like, oh, he's going to be everything. It's going to, you know, yeah. like complete me. And then after the union of sensuality, it's just like, oh, you know, I guess not. You mm -hmm. know, that's, is that what it was? You yeah, know, like, disappointment. Disappointment, totally. Mm -hmm. And talking about media as well, like you look at... Um, how sex is portrayed like there's some cultures that suppress it and then there's some that exploit it mm -hmm. so the ones that suppress it you know it's it's not to be talked about you know keep it uh under wraps and then or the over um kind of like the exploitation or expression of like over sexuality mm. not necessarily like there's so many ranges of an experience of sexuality which are all wonderful you know there can be love making and then there can be like fun fucking mm -hmm. you know so like these two things it's all part of the the spectrum but i find in um on tv what do you see is like this kind of like the like you were saying kind of like the man the, yeah. the passion <laughs> you know and, and like connection in that way as opposed to maybe like the other way which could be complete love making which is yeah. like an amazing 
experience that can be so unifying. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I mean, before we get to that um, part of the conversation, I think that's something that's important to mention is how uneducated we all still are. Like even I'm approaching my 30s now and I still feel so uneducated on like how to really explore my sensuality and how to feel comfortable in expressing myself. And it's funny because preparing for this interview, of course, I was like the universe was helping me prepare and a video popped out in YouTube, a podcast popped up, somebody wrote a post about it in Instagram. Like I just saw so many different places that people were speaking about it. And they were all talking about the fact that um, we're so uneducated on it and how they... Um, they either spoke about their process in becoming comfortable with their sensuality or about not feeling comfortable with it and all of these like boxes that women specifically are put into and we can more, speak more about the female experience because we are mm -hmm. um, but you know there's so much shame around it in talking about it in asking for what you want in um, yeah just like wanting it even um, and I think that it's so important to speak about it. Um, so can we talk a little bit about your experience uh, in your transformation? Because you did go through a transformation with it. So uh, maybe shortly you can speak about the catalyst to the change. Sure, yeah. Um, the catalyst to the change, I mentioned it in my last podcast with you, um, was being raped. So... <clears throat> I um, would have sex with people, you know, like looking for this deeper connection all the time. And so I, I had, would just kind of, th you know, throw away my sensuality or just kind of um, not be very discriminatory of my partners and of the experience. Um, mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> I got myself into a situation where um, I was, I went on a couple of dates with this man and, um, it took me so long to actually say, yes, I was raped. Like I would, I kept blaming myself. Like mm -hmm. I got myself into the situation. I was alone with this person. I didn't kick him off me, you know, um, cause we had built a little bit of rapport through our dates. And then, um, you know, he, he had sex with me and I said, no, like very, you know, firmly and said, please don't. And he, he just did what he wanted to do, told me it would be good for me. Um, yeah. Oh my God. It, so it was like, I, I look back and I'm like, wow, like I just accepted this person doing it to me. Like I did, I was like maybe too afraid to kick him off or to be more vocal or, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, like, you know, like powerless kind of feeling like a powerless kind of person. Yeah. And I feel like that's part of the problem because it's all about like pleasuring the man and making sure that he's happy and our needs are are very much like dismissed um so i'm sure that played a part in it yeah definitely and um in general i was a pretty quiet kind of submissive person so never not feeling kind of that power to control kind of my experience and around sensuality especially because it is an uncontrollable like mm, feeling right yeah, so definitely. it's like and it's also confusing because through the even the act of being raped like um, there's still like some sensual feelings involved because of the stimulation of the genitals. So mm -hmm. like just to even start to look at that was, it was all just very confusing. So, mm -hmm. so that was kind of like the catalyst. I went and saw, it was the first time I saw a therapist after, um, and he was so amazing. He said, um, sometimes the universe taps you on the shoulder and it's like, Hey, Hey, and if you don't listen enough, the universe shoved you down the stairs definitely so this really changed my relationship to sensuality so I always had lots of feelings around sensuality and would act on them um and this muted all of my sensual feelings I just completely lost the you know that um the feelings of sensuality mm -hmm. and connection <clears throat> because it was so attached to fear 
Yeah. And trauma. Yes. Like I would be having a shower and the water would fall on my breasts Mm -hmm. and like make me like I could start feeling the sensuality Mm -hmm. and I would feel sick. Like, Mm -hmm. like, no, like, like I I can't feel that. So as terrible of an experience that can be like, there's two things. I don't know if these are the laws anymore that can get you um, accused for or the penalty to be capital punishment, which is death Mm -hmm. is uh, murder and rape. Mm. um that may have changed but that that at one time existed because sensuality is so potent and is so um like ingrained like life force it's life force energy say it's our life force it's, energy. yeah so like the um the hurting of that uh is so detrimental or can be so detrimental to our psyche and our yeah. experience of being that it was considered punishable by death definitely so can you talk us through that process because I mean I can't even start to imagine the confusion and the hurt that was going on so how did that look like practically like step by step getting out of that Mm -hmm. I feel very fortunate that before I was raped I had that experience also I talked about in the last podcast of becoming one with everything Mm -hmm. um and not existing. So it kind of opened my door to being connected to something more. Mm. And so with that, which was highly confusing, um, at, you know, and I had to integrate it. But then, so after that, then that's when I was raped. And then I had this kind of foundation or connection to mm. something. And so I used, um, I started to explore what that was. And I got some books about Tantra, about Tantrikas, mm. um, um, some books by Daniel Dare, um, some books by Osho, and and I didn't know who these people were. I just went into the New Age section <laughs> at the bookstore, and I was like, just pulled what attracted me, just so I could start to learn about more. And I don't even know why. I don't know anything about tantra. I didn't know anything about about these kinds mm-hmm. of connections and as soon as I started reading the books it just felt like I knew this knowledge already Mm. um and so I knew that there was something there and in one of the books um it talked about uh, like these solo practices that you can do to kind of cultivate this energy so um that took me a while I went through a process of just kind of feeling like confused no sexuality and you know, drinking a lot and to cope and using yeah. drugs to cope. Um, but then once I started educating myself, um, I was doing one of these practices in my bed at night. <clears throat> and it was like a breathing with moving your hips, your pelvis. And um, it was like for the first time in like eight months, I felt sensual energy come into my body and I was accepting it. Mm. Um, and it was wild like it felt like um it felt like there was something um coming up inside me um like into my vagina and then moving up and it was like this orgasm like it literally felt like there was something inside me and this feeling moved all the way up and as long as I kept my mind on it without thinking about what it was or trying to or, or getting sexual like starting to maybe run through scenarios in your head that turn you on um like fantasizing um I just stuck with the sensation alone without that and through that process I was able to on um, I tried like as soon as I started feeling that I started thinking of like kind of sexual scenarios and then it was going away so I was like no no no, breathe and feel because that's mm. what the book also was saying yeah and I felt this energy come all the way up in here and it's like I had an orgasm like right here wow in the like, like under the, the chest yeah like in mm-hmm. the solar plexus mm-hmm. area um and so that was kind of like my first experience. And I was like, wow, like that felt good. And um, what were my next kind of steps? Um, That's so interesting because <clears throat> I think that the fact that you introduced it not by touching mm-hmm. made it more accessible for you. Um, do you find that that's true? Definitely, because like um, sensuality it doesn't necessarily need like stimulation like if i or, or like physical stimulation um uh, really <laughs> yeah it's like <laughs> <laughs> I, I i haven't uh i haven't experienced that okay so 
so kind of fast forwarding i'll talk about some stuff in between but fast forwarding it's like now there's a point um where i can sit in meditation and and call these feelings into my body and have an orgasm I have I have almost had an orgasm with just my mind. What? Just like sitting and feeling and allowing this energy in. Wow. Um, and so when I've almost had an orgasm, it's been like keeping the energy lower, I would say, mm -hmm. kind of more in the second chakra. Yeah. Area. I mean, it becomes a full kind of your your holistic system. So everything is involved. But yeah. I can feel this energy here or And I'll just yeah. say second chakra area is right where the ovaries are, lower belly to yeah. whoever doesn't know. Yeah. yeah. And so there's that experience or th what this kind of conscious awareness of sensuality and these feelings have enabled me to do is um, just with my mind, draw this energy up, this life force energy that, that as we bring it into our bodies, as it meets different chakras, it's a different experience. Mm. So um, if you've heard of maybe like the like the kundalini kind of rising it's like it can be a very overused perhaps term but mm -hmm. but it's it's I'm like it's so true like it's a true concept and and because I, I used to be very atheist so for me it's sometimes <laughs> it's like like oh like what, you know there's there's something here but yeah. I'm moving this energy up in our body so just almost having orgasm through keeping it here or moving it into the heart mm -hmm. um or the third eye and it just is a different experience so as it moves into the heart, it's like, it's this just amazing, loving connection kind of feeling. If this is the chakra involved with connection, this is love. Mm -hmm. um, so this, because some le people aren't uh, oh, yes, watching, watching they're so, listening. So the second chakra, <laughs> so the um, uh, right near the, under the belly button, um, and then moving it up into the heart chakra. Um, yeah, it becomes this different kind of experience of like connecting through love. Um, because oftentimes we think, oh, sensuality, sexuality, you know, it is just this act, but actually it is just life force energy. And when it's kept in the lower chakras, it's a sexual experience, mm -hmm. animalistic, you know, through this connection. But as we bring it up, it can become a whole body, a, a whole and into the third eye it becomes a whole experience of infusing your body with life force energy. Um, wow. And when done with another person, um, it has the capacity to bring us to one of the highest highs that we can experience, I believe, as humans, which is complete union, complete union in our whole energetic system with another being. That kind of reminds me of, um, you know, like, I don't think that anything that exists in our human experience, in our universe, our, our world, is by mistake, so, I mean, to say that our sexuality is bad or that it's something that we shouldn't be exploring or enjoying even, for me, it's just like ridiculous because if it exists, it's meant to be there. And if it's meant to be there, then how can we enjoy it and incorporate it in our experience, in our evolution, in our learning, in our joy, in our, I mean, like in every aspect and one of the things that I find very interesting is that the second chakra is se sensuality and also creativity. Mm -hmm. And I find that so interesting, the connection between the two, this sensual energy is also the creative energy. And of course, that relates to like having children and creating lives, which is the, the highest form of creation. But that can be also to any creative aspect of your of your, your being totally it's like our creativity is like an outlet of how we connect so you mm -hmm. see artists you know it's like a self-expression that's an outward expression becomes an outward expression that then we can connect with yeah so um so when, true yeah so if we have an um dos actually who was also on a podcast i talked yeah. to him about this and we were talking about the creativity and how um, our creative expression is so tied to our self-expression of connecting. Mm. Um, so it was, it was a pretty neat conversation, but yeah. Um, yeah, that's such a beautiful way to look at it that actually our creation, I, I love this. I love that you said that because that's so true. What we create in the world is really the way that we connect. Even 
this podcast, you know, like we're sitting here, you and I having some sort of connection. Whoever is going to be watching it is also going to have some sort of connection with us um, and us with them. And it's so incredible that that becomes possible through a project, a creation. And that can be, of course, applied to so many different things. Mm hmm. I love that. So if you imagine like if our um, if our sensuality is squashed, what happens mm. to our creativity is the same yeah. thing. Um, <clears throat> not to say you can have one without the other, but definitely through the uh, healing of our of our connection with ourselves and how we connect to other people, it just allows our creativity to to blossom. Mm -hmm. um, Do you feel that we can have one without the other? Yes, I think I think we can be creative. Um, perhaps the um, perhaps our relationship to how people connect to it, or or how you know something like that could I think it would could be you know affected, or maybe yeah. like just one kind of certain expression of it. Mm -hmm. I definitely think you can, because sex sensuality also is not necessarily a re relationship to the other; it can be with yourself. Definitely. So. It, I feel like people can totally have this kind of creativity and also, you know, be perhaps, you know, it could even be fuel for the type of creativity or the type mm. of art or whatever that they are producing, you know, whatever their relationship is to their sensuality. Mm. Um, you know, it's like thinking about the second chakra, mm -hmm. that that would also influence 100% their type of creation or art that they're yeah. connecting through i'm thinking of two different conversations that i've had recently with two different women one of them who felt that her there is not much sensuality happening in her marriage and she told me that she feels that she really was able to channel that energy into creating and then another woman who also has a um, lack of sensuality in her marriage said that it really affected her creativity in that it dimmed the creativity. Totally. And interesting, I don't know much about it, so pardon if I'm not being accurate or very descriptive, but there's, I was reading about um, this life force energy and, and in some parts of, I believe it was India, um, as children are first starting to have these feelings coming into them, there's actually education on how to um, work with this energy. Um, because it is creative life force energy. So instead of it being channeled only through sexuality, um, there's an education on how to channel it into arts and creativity. Wow, that's uh, beautiful. Yeah, it was amazing. Just like that concept of education of working with that energy. I thought it was yeah, amazing. That is amazing. Hey, I'm quickly interrupting the episode to extend an invitation. If you are interested in deepening into any of the subjects we talk about on the podcast, we offer many different experiences on our beautiful grounds here in Baja, Mexico. From nine-day modules such as sound healing and yoga nidra, to breath and meditation, as well as two or 300-hour yoga teacher trainings, and many different shorter retreats. Check out our website, yandara.com, to see all the information about the different experiences. Let's get back to the episode. During orgasm, what happens in our brain is the amygdala, who is wired into keeping us safe. Um, it, it's basically, yeah, it, it it really guides us in almost all of our decisions that we make as human beings um, to keep us into safe ways. So when we have orgasm, what actually happens is we become completely open. You think yeah. about being an orgasm, you're just, you're helpless, right? Mm -hmm. You're just kind of in this light and this like pleasure. It's um, a release. It's a release. Yeah. yeah. A complete letting go yeah. of, of everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the amygdala, what happens during orgasm is it takes a back seat. So this little governor who keeps you safe, you know, yeah. like your little guard, mm -hmm. um, he just stops being a guard for a little bit. Yeah. Um, so if that can be very scary for for our psyche, for ourselves, because who's who's minding the store? Mm. You know, who's there? Yeah. Um, watching and keeping you safe. So and that oh, comes yeah. from a mentality of like, I need to keep myself safe. Like something isn't safe if I'm not protecting. I'm like some I'm vulnerable. Yeah. Like it's it's not having control mm. when we have there's no control in orgasm. Look what happens to your body. Like your body does weird things. Your face can do, you know, yeah. weird. I'm doing air quotes, weird things. <laughs> it's not weird at all. It's extremely yeah. human and normal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we let go and, and lose kind of our our 
facade. Yes, totally. Some practices that I um, really help me to allow my body to move without my control. Mm. So we're very calculated in how we move. So yeah. how do we how do we practice, you know, letting go into our bodies moving? So mm -hmm. <clears throat> one practice that I found that I really, really liked that kind of started opening me to, to um, uncontrolled movement um, was uh, this breath work called trauma release, trauma release exercise, trauma re release something, TRE. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> the how it works is, we store so much of our emotions in our hips. You've probably heard this a million of times. Course, yeah. And it's like, well, why? So when we move into fight or flight response, um, our hip flexors, I believe they, they, um, they, they contract to get us ready mm -hmm. for running, running or fighting. Yeah. Um, so since we are so compounded by stress in ways that aren't real, it's like imaginary stress of, you know, of, yeah, so many things, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the social anxiety, all this stuff that aren't actually things that we should go into fight or flight about. Yeah. We should go into fight or flight when our lives are endangered, yeah. this kind of thing. But we're so overstimulated and stressed out as a population that we go into fight or flight way too much. Yeah. Um, so um, what this exercise allows us to do is to work with our hip flexors. So we store, that's why we store, all, like one of the reasons why we can store all these emotions in our hips is because it is the spot where the fight or flight response physically occurs in our body. And how is that related? So it is related because um, this exercise, this trauma release exercise, what it does is it allows our hip flexors to let go. Mm. And so it's this, you lay on your back um, and you just you do these movements with your your knees and kind of start to activate your hip flexors and then eventually um this kind of inner tremor mm -hmm. comes in and your legs move wildly and and at any time you can stop it but it is a choice to allow the tremor to mm -hmm. keep moving in your body and that just happens from like moving your knees <laughs> yeah like you have your like um you're laying with your feet together you're in like a diamond shape with your knees out mm -hmm. and then so you you know if you're doing like ab exercises how you start shaking sometimes mm -hmm. it's the same type of thing so you wait until your knees start shaking and as you bring them up more they literally just start flopping around <laughs> and it, yeah it's like it, I did this in a big group setting which was super <laughs> empowering but mm -hmm. also a little scary because you're like doing these movements but when you look around and see other people it happening to them yeah. you're like okay yeah, you know, I can do this. You know, yeah. I'm not alone. <laughs> um, so it allowed me to start to feel kind of this like free movement uh, in my body. And it seems perhaps so minor, um, but it, it became like a huge kind of impact on allowing that free movement, which then led me to be able to dance and love aesthetic dance and expression through dance. And mm -hmm. um, so that's also been a big help is aesthetic dance and just allowing myself to move and feel and express whatever I'm feeling without words because I find that so challenging. Mm -hmm. So dance has been a huge, huge thing to kind of allow myself to to let go, like mm -hmm. lose control. Yeah, beautiful. So that could be an exercise to, to look at. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Oh, and, and also one other thing was yeah. is breath work. Um, mm. The specifically I have experience in doing the um, the rebirthing breath. So while having a sensual experience. No. So this uh, relates to the allowing kind of uncontrolled movement mm. relating to like orgasm, right? Because if orgasm is kind of that letting go into the moment without doing anymore, mm -hmm. then this breath work also kind of has mm. this experience as a potential right um so through doing that breath work um yeah just allowing the body to kind of move and to have energy flowing yeah. in and out without any control this breath work is very much a lesson in trust mm. and letting go of control definitely it's it's yeah it's so much about this letting go of control so maybe we can go back to your process of healing we were talking about you reading these books and trying the exercises where did it go from there where did it go from there because i think that could be also relevant to my experience or other people's experience yes totally so i started to um just get okay kind of with these feelings in my body i guess that's an important point too because i think it's really about starting to become comfortable with it like talking about it isn't 
is going to do only so much, but you just have to do it and practice. I remember when I was like, I was maybe 18. I was in a girl's trip in Amsterdam and I told my friends who were all older than me that I've never orgasmed and they were all like shocked and they were like, you're going to the hotel today, <laughs> you're going to touch yourself. And um, I feel like that's very common, um, that girls are afraid to explore by themselves and I feel like many women haven't even experienced an orgasm because they don't know how or that they're allowed to. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that it's very common in, in women to have kind of this relationship to it. And then there's so much stigma around it, too. Like then when I've talked to people, it's like their shame. You know, I'm this mm. I'm this age and never had an orgasm. Like, yeah. what is this? Not even knowing what it is or feeling like I can't mm -hmm. do it and thinking that there's something wrong with their sexuality. But really, I have found that the sexuality is just kind of like an expression and our relationship to it. It's our expression of how we relate to life. So even like um, our sexual preferences or the porn that we like to watch, you know, like um, it, it, it's all it's just like a psychological reflection because I've talked to people and they've been really like, and like, this is the kind of porn that I'm watching. Is there something wrong with me? Because mm. you know, it's considered very taboo or like bad, you know, and um, it's like, no, it's just, there's just, you, it's, it's showing you something, whatever elements are involved in, whether it's power struggle or, or domination or um, inflicting pain or um, anything like this, um, it's, it, there's just a relationship to look at there and so it's mm -hmm. it's like the outward expression like specifically you know like um a lot of people have come you know concerned about fantasies of um like um, of rape mm -hmm. and domination like this and it's like what's wrong with me is the thing and it's like well no perhaps it's not there's nothing wrong with you it's maybe that's it's just reflecting that you know um a feeling of not being in control so mm -hmm. then you get to be in control through sexuality or the opposite of wanting to completely let go and so that would be kind of like the victim mm -hmm. um and finding attraction there because it's something that you're attracted to not necessarily that scenario but the idea of completely letting go mm -hmm. of control or completely being in control yeah um so I think it's just so complex and, yeah. and because of the, yeah, the lack of education or understanding of this life force energy and how it relates to our whole system and our psyche, there's just so many confusing feelings about it. And then, and then it goes offside, you know, then if we keep feeling like we need to hide our sexuality right. or hide our preferences, then it's just a little message to yourself saying, I'm not good enough. This part of me is wrong. Mm. This part of me is unlovable. Um, which stops us from our wholeness you know, mm -hmm. if we can't love every part of ourselves as I talked about in the last podcast then it's like you know it, it prevents us from being totally engaged in the capacity of what life can offer mm -hmm. or our human experience can offer yeah if you feel like a part of you is wrong or something that you need to hide then of course that affects our whole experience even if we don't realize that it is. Yeah, definitely. Like, oh, no, I don't need to say that, or that part's not important, or mm -hmm. I don't, you know, this is, um, oh, I don't, yeah, I can hide that. It's okay. Yeah. It just literally starts to block our connection to ourselves, to mm -hmm. other people. If we feel like we have something to hide, that we can't be totally open mm -hmm. with people. Or um, our partner. Or our partner, yeah, or ourselves. Yeah. And then that in turn stifles our, our creativity as well. Yeah. And I think that's like sending a message to yourself that what you want is not important or not valid or not or wrong even. Like yeah. that's the most harmful because if we think that something about us is wrong, then that of course ripples out to other parts of ourselves. And, you know, that's like the worst feeling ever. Yeah, definitely. We can't we're not open to experience the f that joy yeah so let's talk about that like how does somebody get past that feeling because it's so ingrained in us you know it's it's not something easy to do mm -hmm. I can only speak from kind of my experience around everything mm -hmm. um I think one of the most helpful things um that has happened to me 
um, through kind of reintroducing sensuality in my body um, is um, is having a has largely been involved with my um, one of my partners who who saw me um, and just this is a difficult thing to talk about <laughs> um, yeah through my um, one of my partners who's a very good friend um, still um, through I guess his love um, and I feel I've talked to, to him about kind of like his path around sensuality and and it seemed um, different than mine and also men in general actually speaking of men um, if you think about their first sexual experiences and not to downplay kind of what that is but just in general usually the act ends with a male orgasm mm -hmm. so I would this kind of I was like oh my god had like an epiphanistic movement was like okay my first experiences with sensuality were just like oh that kind of hurt yeah. or yeah. <laughs> or that was like you know interesting this dude on top of me this weird face yeah. and like just pounding away kind of thing <laughs> and ending Oh, it just ended. Um, <laughs> whereas the man, it ends with extreme pleasure and that opening of the orgasm that we talked about, that full yeah. letting go. Yeah. And so that's their relationship. Um, mm -hmm. Like to stereotype and generalize, definitely not everybody. Yeah. So that was interesting. And so this um, this man um, just... Um, I, he made me feel beautiful. He uh, he was present. He was perhaps like one of the first present love makers that I'd ever experienced. And that made me feel safe. Mm -hmm. So I guess it was through our dialogue and our talking. And, and I mean, there's just an incredible, unreal kind of, um, I would say like a karmic spark between us that mm -hmm. like we were meant to but we knew each other before in other lives. And so when we came together in this lifetime, it was like um, just kind of uh, amazing and super healing. And um, and being able to, so he's the first partner that I had that I was able to talk about sex with mm -hmm. and to, um, to kind of talk about what we like and what we don't like and this kind of comfort around that. And, mm -hmm. and I had never been able to have orgasms in my life um with my partners I faked it a lot yeah. <laughs> I just thought of as I said that of now course. I was like maybe they're gonna listen and be like what <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely nothing against the 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 men that I've been with it's my 100% my relationship to yeah. myself and that letting go feeling I know exactly what you're talking about it's like I feel kind of shy to say that I'm not there yet so I'm just gonna like I don't want to make him wait so like I'm just gonna fake it so that like you know the pressure's off yeah and to make them feel good yeah. as well because it's yeah yeah the recognition like okay I just don't orgasm you know mm -hmm. that was unless I'm uh, pleasuring myself mm -hmm. and so with this um with my friend he um he was the first one to kind of I could have consistent orgasms with and it was through the safety that we created with each other in this space through dialogue and through um yeah just kind of like this something else as well mm -hmm. um and so I think that it because of his healthy kind of relationship I would view as a healthier than mine relationship with sensuality that he taught me so much in being comfortable with that and we could talk about it and I could share for the first time just being able to share my truth of I don't have orgasms you know um wow um this is what I like, this is what I don't like, and not even really knowing, but just because of the the connection, I actually felt safe for the first time to start to to open up. And so to say I'm grateful for this person does not do any amount of justice because it allowed me to start to actually accept these feelings into my body, have consistent orgasms. If I wanted to have an orgasm for the first time in my life, I could be like, hey, I want to have an orgasm. And then, it, so it's like, because I was able to then kind of open and do that process of letting go with him, I started to feel more and more safe. And we, and because our, um, so it started to morph kind of into something more. So 
sensuality is so potent like who we have orgasms in their energetic field with Mm -hmm. so if you think about it if you become completely open and whoever's with you in that moment you are completely open to their energy and their energetic field so it's extremely potent orgasms um and i'm talking right now about just kind of sexual orgasms in the second chakra area so through kind of that opening letting go which is allowing is trusting Mm -hmm. um we're able to um without even really knowing it, but just through being in my body, allowing myself to feel pleasure, not worrying about what I look like. Yeah. What is he thinking? And just kind of moving into complete experience of of sensation, mm-hmm. um, which Vipassana meditation helped me a lot with, mm-hmm. learning body sensation. Mm-hmm. But through that, then um, something just amazing happened was after making love, and I, I will call it making love, this time because it can be you know sex um in one way but then it morphed into this making love and became into my heart and into the third eye and it was like you know everything kind of changed the way that it looked um it was like seeing each other's soul like we had like it was like a i would call it like a spiritual or a what is another word name for spiritual experience like a metaphysical wow. or mystic mystic, mystic. experience um, so through, and it was just through the orgasm through pleasure, because that's when our amygdala takes a back seat, which mm-hmm. keeps us protected. Yeah. And so through the sensuality, it allows the amygdala to stop and to allow yourself to be open and present yeah. without fear. That's amazing. What I'm really hearing is about like the discernment we have with our partners, because as you said about your experience, and I've experienced this too, and I'm sure millions of women all over the world, um, when we're starting off, it's unclear, like the discernment isn't really there. And you might be like, for me, like I felt, yeah, like women in movies have one night stands, like I can try it. And then like it, through the experience of it feeling horrible, I realized like, no, I don't like that. And I think that, that I realized that how important it is to only open up in that way with somebody who earned it, somebody who you feel safe with, somebody who will honor it and respect you and, you know, respect the whole situation of of really opening up in this way that feels so, so vulnerable. I mean, physically we're naked and... And it's not just like our physical body that's naked. It's really like this, like you said, like this opening up and letting go. And you kind of hope somebody will catch you and, you know, of this like jump. And it's so, so important who you do that with. So I think that's a really important point that I'm hearing from what you said, that when it was a person who really created that safe space for you and with you, Um, it changed the experience completely. Definitely. And I think it's like kind of everyone has their own journey of how they, you know, explore their sensuality. So for me, I've never been comfortable with one night stands simply because they just wouldn't feel good. If I had no connection with the person to feel any type of safety or rapport, then it just wouldn't feel good. So to me, I kind of naturally stayed away from one night stands. Um, And a funny thing about the amygdala, it's like if you notice that you're attracted to like the same type Mm -hmm. often and you're like, why? You know, it's maybe not the you feel like it's like not the most ideal thing for you. (laughs) Um, Again, our attractions are based. Our amygdala does this for us. So our amygdala wants to keep us in known patterns, known Mm. ways of being. So based on our um, um, relationships or something maybe from our younger years, um, it will simply just seek out that same persona to keep us in a known Mm. cycle as opposed to a new experience. Even if it's not a good one? Because, yes, even if it's not a good one because you lived. This is how basic the amygdala Mm. lived. You physically survived. survived. So uh, the unknown is the unknown. So say if you're, Mm. okay, just typical scenario here a lot, attracted to the bad boy, Mm -hmm. okay? may not be maybe he's not emotionally available maybe you know that kind of thing but the amygdala's like you survived we're just going to keep doing that yeah and this is typical um because if you think again about 
most people's relationship with their sensuality as being taboo or naughty, this kind of thing, then you're just going to kind of seek that to validate mm-hmm. the belief. Yeah. So um, instead of, you know, perhaps trying someone new, um, you'll just kind of be attracted to the same thing. So for amygdala attraction, if you're like really attracted to somebody like right away, I'm always like, stop, <laughs> take a step back, get away from their energetic field because that's influencing you a hundred percent because it's a vibration that we're sensing that we're attracted to. So get out of the energetic field, look at them, you know, and be be, dis- be discerning. Mm-hmm. Are they going to be good for me? Can Will I feel safe or can I feel safe? Mm-hmm. These types of things. And um, and then if you choose, yes, I want to go for it, then go for it. And then uh, if not, don't. But it's, to me, it's always a reassessment of how you feel all the time. Mm-hmm. So how did that feel? It's never good or bad, like acting on things. It's just always... A situation that is there then for review so that if we become aware of how we feel in these different scenarios it's like okay i felt good in this one where the elements evolved then we can repeat that and if it's something that didn't make us feel good then instead of being hard on ourselves or i shouldn't have done that it's like oh wait this is what i can do differently in the future to start Mm -hmm. to kind of sculpt where i want to head yeah because it's a learning process right Mm -hmm. we we started the conversation with speaking about the fact that we're so uneducated So a big way for us to educate ourselves is just trial and error. Yeah, Yeah. totally. And like you were saying about too, like one night stands, it's the same thing, like having them and being like, for some people, it's just fine, you know, or their relationship to it is is okay. But for some people, it's like, no, that's not for me. I want something different. So neither is good or bad. They're just Mm -hmm. what's best for ourselves. Do you think anybody really enjoys them? one night stands <laughs> i think so i yeah. think some people can <laughs> yes i i do i from talking to people some people it's they i mean i can go by what they tell me mm-hmm. and they say you know like yes they like it so for me after kind of healing um or kind of starting to become more friends with my sensuality and understanding it and feeling more in control of being out of control mm-hmm. um I felt empowered and so I um, I did have you could say like a one night stand um, with a friend though again so the rapport was there yeah um, but it was so empowering to be like I want to have sex I want to have sex with this person I'm gonna have an orgasm or like <laughs> I know I can mm-hmm. and then going out and doing it you know mm-hmm. with the with the conscious conversation of you know, of what it was. I, mm. I believe for myself, I think that that's important moving into sensual relationships for me to kind of talk about expectations and, yeah. and what's kind of happening. And then were you able to not get attached? Yes. Mm-hmm. That'd be, yes, because in, I'm not sure maybe exactly why, but it's, um, I, I think it's from my work of cultivating kind of love and compassion. So um, for yourself, for myself, or? yeah. And not relying, not using sex as a way to fill something within myself. Mm. It Instead of, yeah, instead of having the motivation being out of lack or want mm-hmm. of like needing something, it, it felt like, yes, I needed maybe perhaps to feel the power and to kind of know I was in control. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was very different than kind of looking for someone to fill me. Yeah. It was like, I can, sensuality is amazing. It can be so connecting. Yeah. Um, so, and it's physical pleasure of the body, yeah. um, everything, the mind and everything. So I'm yeah. just saying that because now my view of sensuality and especially the connection between two people is just so sacred that I feel like it's something that really shouldn't be taken lightly. I this is how I feel right now for myself as well and I mean hindsight's always 2020 I would mm-hmm. never change anything I did but mm-hmm. I can see my motivations mm-hmm. for sexuality in the past and um so as myself now yes of course I would mm-hmm. like perhaps do things differently and not sleep with so many people to for self-validation or acceptance or, or a way to think that was the only way to deepen relationship with human maybe you can speak about how you view sensuality today right so for me how i view it now is is that sexuality is sacred it is if i'm going to be completely open it's like it's just to me it's like a choice of who do i want to do that with Mm -hmm. um what yeah like what is that and in my relationship to it so for me at this point 
I'm yeah, I'm not interested in just sleeping with someone for pleasure. To me, it's like a hundred percent more of a deeper connecting it's in so a deeper way. So much more pleasurable when it's with somebody that you care about and you feel safe with. Yes, I, and I was, I was talking about this the other day. Um, is like, um, when if I just have like sex or just like fuck, it's one experience and it's like a. A certain type of pleasure but through when there's that rapport and that conscious connection with the other person and they're on board it becomes like a full body experience yeah um which the pleasure then instead of just being kind of maybe contained to the lower areas it's like the pleasure permeates like up into the heart and mm. into the hands and you know into the head into the throat it's like your body becomes pleasure yeah um Definitely. I view it like, almost like a wave. Like I kind of feel like I'm dancing or this like wave is happening. It's so true. It's like a wave of energy through the body. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I think we spoke about so much and this has been really interesting for me. Thank you for sharing so openly. Is there anything else that you think is important to mention? Yes. So... <clears throat> something I've become very passionate about. I feel myself getting teary about it almost is because I've worked with so many women mm. and seeing how people grow up with their relationship to sensuality is like um, a message that I would just love to shout from the rooftops is like sensuality um, can bring you to like ultimate connection, like to like a, to a union with through sensuality, through the union with another, there is an experience waiting in our human capacity that uh, is absolutely amazing through conscious sensuality that can be life changing mm -hmm. to through. It's like allowing, allowing us to what we all want on our deepest level is to just completely melt into somebody else. Like this is what our yeah. soul craves. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even in yogic philosophy, what are, why do you do asana practice is to prepare the body for meditation. Why do you meditate to, to reach some type of union, yoga, union to yoke. Nirvana. Nirvana. It's yeah. To reach this union with ourselves, with the universe. And so we can actually, use the power of it's like a portal you're a portal and it doesn't mm. even have to be through sensuality yeah but if we are safe with the sensuality in our body and we allow it to move up into our chakras i can sit here and have a tantric experience you know with a person just by sitting across from them sex does not have to be involved but it can be an extremely healing gateway or sensuality it doesn't even have to be sex mm. sensuality is this amazing healing gateway to allowing ourselves to connect deeper um, with the other person allows us to to love in a deeper way allows us to be there for our children this is one a huge benefit i have found is if i'm around children oh my god it's like th because i'm not afraid to connect anymore mm. because of working with life force energy and the sensuality i can just sit with a child and like I swear there's like an energetic bubble that comes around us of just complete love and being there for the person. There's no holding back in love. Mm. Um, so that would that's one thing I just want to like scream is like sensuality is an amazing tool um, for connecting and finding connection on so many different levels. And it's worth looking at. It's worth exploring and can bring you to to a state of complete union with another soul. Definitely. Yeah. And that's just the beginning gateway because then like to me, once you start to learn about the sensual energy, it's it be as I was saying, it moves up in your body. It becomes not just in your sexual chakras, but into your whole being so that you can you can live more fully and inhabit your body and therefore love more fully, which from my last podcast is everything like having that compassion and the connection um, to me has just been absolutely life changing. So that would be like something I would love to just get out there and preach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love, 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 love that. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Well, maybe as my last question, I don't know if you feel comfortable saying, talking about this or like giving advice about this, but for parents who have young children and want to maybe, you know, introduce sensuality 
in a way that will create a healthy relationship with it. Do you have any advice about that? To be honest, it baffles me to the core. It's mm. not something <laughs> that I ever received. So I'm even unsure of what that would look like, how it would be implemented, the age to do it at. Um, I have no idea. Mm. Um It's like sometimes I think I've thought a lot about it and it's like, yeah, what what do you do? Um, Because everybody, um, I've had the amazing opportunity to get close to a young girl and I have seen her go, you know, from childhood and transitioning through puberty and I'm always like, like, I want to protect you. I want to shelter you from everything. And I'm like, that's not life. You know, yeah, there can be like, you know, the preferred atmospheres or environments to, to raise kids in and everything. But everyone has their, their karmic thing and everyone's going to be scarred and marred. Mm-hmm. And so to me, maybe, and I mean, I don't have children. I, it's hard for me to speak about it, but just creating the rapport mm-hmm. with the child that you can talk about anything. Yeah. Um, that and perhaps that could be you know just a I don't know just a starting point if they feel safe enough to talk to you about anything that's going on with them then to me that's that's would be the only first step that I would know yeah. about and what I, I'm thinking about is that maybe just like ask ask somebody who does know like yeah. a sexual therapist or something like that because just having it having it in our consciousness that children are experiencing these feelings and they need information about it so just having that in our consciousness um that that's happening is already a a step yeah Mm -hmm. definitely wonderful yeah and thank you so so much i so appreciate you taking this time and open and opening up and speaking so freely Oh, thank you. I'm so passionate about this topic and um, I love talking about it and would love to have further conversations and and I would love if people commented and, or had questions just to start dialogue because I'm by no means an expert. I can only speak from kind of my own experience. And mm-hmm. so I, one thing I have found so helpful in talking, I, I will talk to some smaller groups um, of my people that I work with. Um, I will introduce this topic to their groups um and across the board it's always like that was so beneficial just to talk about it like no conclusions are ever made no like this is right this is wrong but just to hear perspective and to create the conversation of how do you relate to sexuality and your sexuality and learning from one another just having that kind of base platform of hey let's talk about this and yeah. what are the capa- like what is the potential of this why do they call it love making mm-hmm. you know like like what is that yeah. um and um so yeah just talking talking yeah. about it taking it out from being taboo yeah definitely so i would love to see comments and to learn that's how that's how i've learned so much for myself is just from talking to people of their experiences and and connecting in that way beautiful mm-hmm. thank you so much thank you yeah Now, after this time to nurture your mind and your spirit, we invite you to take a moment to consider others. A kind wish might come to mind. Know that what we learn becomes more valuable when we apply it and share it with others. So share this episode on Instagram stories, tag Yandara and I, or share with a loved one so that more people can benefit from it. Our hope is that the search will lead you home to who you already are to what was always there. We'll be back next week with more inspiration, honest conversation, and insight into the energetic world around us. Thank you for listening and watching.